Well, I suspect this is going to land on all kinds of lists this year. Stick around and I'm going to tell you why. Hello, Internet. Chris Klein here with Alma Music Center in San Antonio, Texas. And we are going to take a deeper look at Roland's SH-4D today. And I, I know that my unboxing video, if you've seen it, was kind of wonky. Um, you was not prepared at all because I hadn't really done any research on this. Brand new device, really, really cool. Now I have, I've you know, delved into it quite a bit more. So much more that this is now mine. I'm going to keep it. I love it. Uh, but before I move on and we start talking about how wonderful this new machine is, uh, I'd like to ask that you please subscribe if you haven't already. And uh, don't forget, we also have a piano channel, guitar channel, b &O, accordion. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have more channels in the future. And, uh, you know, we want to continue to bring you great content. We uh, want to listen to what kind of content you want. So, you know, comment down below. And uh, I'm going to stop blathering. And we're just going to jump into the SH-4D because this device is a wealth of fun. And I think it's going to land on a lot of lists this year. So let's do this. So here we are with Roland's SH-4D. This is a... Groove box, that's the best way to describe it. Pattern sequencer, uh, you know, let's differentiate that from a drum machine. This does have drum parts, uh, but this is a pattern sequencer at its core. That's how it works uh, with uh, four parts and a fifth rhythm part. And uh, there's just so much you can do with it. We have 11 different oscillator models built into here, and they have those broken up. Classic, modulated, future, legacy, and rhythm. The classic, you have what, what they call the SH-4D, and then the SH-3D model, and a chord model as well, so you can actually dial in chords uh, with, with different voicings, which is really, really fantastic. Uh, you have uh, modulated oscillators. Those are the ring model and the sync model. I'll let your imaginations run wild. I'm pretty sure you, you know what that means. Future, they have an FM model, wavetable model, legacy, which is the SH-101, the Juno 106, and PCM sounds, and there are a little over 40 PCM sounds in here. You can also create your own waveforms by drawing them in. And then with the rhythm part, the, again, four, four synth parts and a fifth rhythm part, you have 49 preset kits, 64 slots for your own, and 26 instruments per kit. So there is a lot that you can do with the rhythm part on here. I'm going to try to steer away from calling it a drum machine. Let's call it a rhythm part. Once again, it is a pattern sequencer. 60 notes of polyphony total. Uh, you can chew through that pretty quickly depending on how complex um, your patches are. You have an arpeggiator, uh, five types of uh, arpeggiation, uh, 95 effect types, which include different types of reverbs, delays, lo-fi options, uh, shimmer reverbs, pitch options, Juno-style chorus, uh, it runs on four AA batteries, or you can use um, a USB Type-C that's connected to your computer or to some sort of phone charger, or if you have one of those um, uh, outlets that has multiple USB ports on it, that, which is pretty handy when you're getting into some of the, the Roland uh, devices today, in particular the boutiques and whatnot. Um, you can use that. You also have global effects on here, EQ, compression. You can apply other types of time-based and modulated effects. Um, the panel has 32 knobs, uh, four sliders, a wealth of buttons. Uh, the buttons tend to be multi-purpose. You have your keyboard, you have your uh, pattern, uh, excuse me, your steps here uh, for the sequencer. And if you look underneath the steps, you have a silk screen. Uh, words that tell you uh, how these can also function. Record, edit, part one, part two. It's for switching around to different parts, uh, to changing tones. The matrix. The matrix is a way that you can modulate pretty much anything uh, on the SH-4D. So there's a lot of modulation capability in here as well, which I really haven't fully explored yet. Um, you've got your tempo, undo, copy, utility for you know global stuff, clear menu for more global stuff. Uh, page tie, write, D motion, which is really super, super cool. Um, it, it's, see if you can, let, me, let me turn it on so I can just demonstrate it real fast. And so if you can see the, the uh, LCD readout, as I tilt the device, it will start to change the patch. And it just depends on you know, 
what is preset in the patch as far as modulation. Um, it can, you know, it can do anything from, you know, be a, a filter sweep to uh, controlling your LFO. Uh, it's really up to you as to, you know, how you want to uh, tweak that. Um, as far as the sequencer is concerned, you have a, a 128 patterns organized as eight banks with 16 patterns each with up to 64 steps. Um, patterns can contain step data, panning, volume, any number of uh, parameters. Uh, even effects parameters can be manipulated through uh, pattern data. The parts, four parts, fifth part for your rhythm, uh, will, also contain, will also contain certain information like panning, EQ, effects, things of that nature. So once again, really, really powerful. Right now, it's being run off of battery power, four AA batteries. Um, you know, I think I use this for, oh, maybe a total of four hours uh, in the past couple of days, and it chewed through the batteries. Um, now, it was the batteries that came with it. I don't, you know, they're probably, you know, generic, uh, you know, cruddy batteries. I, I, who knows? I haven't put EverReadies or uh, Energizers or, you know, any of the name brand, the big brand batteries in here to, to test out um, how long it will uh, play, how, how much playing time you get. Uh, I would imagine with a name brand battery, you might get a little bit more, but it probably also depends on how much information you are manipulating and uh, tweaking in the device. I haven't done any research, you know, outside of um, uh, my own, you know, hands-on playing to, to see what the battery life is like, what I can expect. I find that most of the time in marketing materials, they feed you a few lines of BS that tell you that you're going to get a lot of battery life, and when you really start digging in, you chew through them pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, if you're out and about and you are creating and this is with you and you have a laptop and, you know, the laptop is being plugged in, my suggestion is to always have a USB cable, a USB-C, so you can plug it into your laptop and feed power to the device without, you know, blowing through batteries because that gets expensive really, really fast. All right. So we can listen to a few patterns just to get an idea of, of what this can do. And then I will go through a couple of things as we're listening to some patterns. So let's go ahead and go to pattern one. Uh, for those of you that pick up one of these devices, if you open it up and plug it in and press the start button, this is what you're going to hear first. So if we look over here, we have our filter section. If you remember in my unboxing video, um, you know, I tried to get a grasp on the filter and it's really not too crazy. I mean, if we look at it, we do have a dedicated high pass filter, but then we can switch between low pass, band pass, and high pass for an additional layer of uh, high pass filtering. And then you have your cutoff, your resonance, and uh, keyboard tracking. So depending on where you are on the keyboard and how much you have this turned up, well, that's going to influence the cutoff and the resonance. We also have our envelope for our filter, attack, decay, sustain, release, uh, the envelope overall level, which we can boost or decrease uh, to further manipulate the overall feel of the envelope. And then there is an additional drive circuit as well. So you can kind of get an idea of what's happening there. And then we go down to our the standard uh, amplitude envelope, or, or excuse me, the ADSR, so we can actually manipulate the way the sound opens up and propagates. And then we also have our pan. tied to our amplitude envelope and our overall level as well. And if we look over here, uh, we are looking at uh, the oscillator that we're using um, right now. And let's do this. Let me go to... So I will press shift and we are on part one. So we are looking at the SH4D oscillator right now. And our sliders are going to control 
the level of the individual oscillators that make up the global oscillator, if you will, for the SH4D. So if we look here, we have pulse, sawtooth pulse, and then we also have a white noise generator. So as I bring this up, you can hear the white noise get incorporated into the sound. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn the effect all the way off. There we go. So now we're just listening to the SH4D. And again, um, you know, as I had stated, there are 11 different oscillator models. So in the SH4D, we can actually, we can change these waveforms, right? So if you see here, we have the pulse. And if I, if you see here, this is, this is going to select the waveform and then, or excuse me, it's gonna select one of four waveforms and then this knob will actually allow me to change the waveform, right? And then I can balance that here. our mighty LFO that sits here as well. And if we incorporate the filter into it, let's go ahead and turn our resonance all the way up. It really is quite robust. So it's quite easy to get lost in building sounds. Now, if we look here in the oscillator section, we can actually change the model of the oscillator. So SH4D, if I turn this, it goes to SH3D, where now we have three different oscillators that we can choose from. Can go ahead and turn it on. Oops, let's do that. Go to the next one. And then the fourth oscillator is actually going to be an LFO of some kind. So you can actually use white noise for your LFO. You can hear it starts to go into like FM territory, really. Super powerful. So now we have sync. and we can change the waveforms here as well. SH-101. Now I have an OG SH-101 at home and you may have seen my video before where I profess my love for it and I have claimed that it is the greatest monosynth of all time and then I got all kinds of people barking back at me telling me that I was crazy and whatnot. But hey, you know what? That's how I feel about it and feelings are uh, all very personal to us, and it's just what I think. I love the SH-101. Uh, does this feel like the SH-101 SH to me? Uh, it's not quite. You know, the SH-101 is such a beautiful, robust synth, and the filters on it are absolutely stunning, and when you start to incorporate the, uh, the sub oscillator on the SH-101, it just goes to other places. It, it, it just has such a great timbre and tonal characteristic to it. And uh, it's nice having a familiar friend in here. But at the end of the day, I'm probably going to reach out to my OG SH-101 and, and, and play that instead of you know this. Or, or this would become like a sketch tablet for me. And then I would dial in the sound on my SH-101 and uh, you know, seek the, uh, sync the sequencer there. But again, it's really, really nice to have this here. Really great device, the SH-101. And as we continue, we have the Juno 106. And if we look 
these buttons will actually inform you as to what they're going to do. Sometimes these buttons change. You can mute the device or it can add functionality. In this case, we're turning off the uh, pulse and or the um, sawtooth. Now we have both on. Turn up the LFO. Pulse width modulation. Sub. And then noise. Here we have their FM synth. You can see how it manipulates the waveforms over here in, in the uh, LCD. Here's the ring modulator. And so you can see how much information we're feeding into it. There we go, it starts to get really crazy and fun. And of course we can also change the waveform. So there's... Oh, that's really cool. It's really metallic. I think if we spent a little more time on this, we could kind of get a didgeridoo sound and we could try to recreate the magic that Aphex Twin uh, produced back in the 90s. And we would probably fail miserably at it, but, but you can kind of hear where this is going. And so, you know, I just love that there's so many options for sound design and for creating your own unique patches. Uh, there is no end to what you can do there. And I honestly, I think that Roland could maybe hurt some of their other products because they pack so much into this and it's at such a great price point. I think it's just gonna, it's gonna blow people away once they start digging into it and really you know, figuring out how far they can stretch it. Um, and again, you know, I said something about maybe like using it as a sketchbook, like with the SH-101, for instance. I, you know, I would bring my own SH into the equation. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I'm waiting for the day when I see somebody pull this out of a backpack in a cafe somewhere and they pop, you know, pop their headphones on and they start creating right then and there. And maybe something that would ultimately be a finished product. Uh, it's just that powerful. So now we're looking at uh, our wavetables, right? And so we can change the wave, the waveform. Let me make sure my filter's open so you can actually hear what's going on. So, you know, we have some pretty standard waves. You know, we have a kind of a, a sign. We're getting a little closer to what would be considered a triangle. And you can kind of hear it, you know, and it even says here brilliant. Another brilliant. Here's another sine wave with a, a peak in it. Sine blend, square to saw, saw sync. So you have some more complex waveforms on here. FM bells. I'm changing the LFO depth. And here we go to the chord which I'd mentioned before. And you can even create inversions.
And so as we change the chord voicings, we can always invert them as well. So I'm going to say it one more time. And by the, by the time I'm done with this, I'm going to the comments are going to be like, and it's really, really this and blah, blah, blah. And I, trust me, I know how I talk. There's a lot you can do with it. There really, really is. So now we have, let's, let's go ahead and stay here. Actually, you know what? Let's move to the, uh, this. You can actually draw your own waveform in, right? So if you see here, I'm actually addressing the waveform in chunks. I've got four chunks that I can manipulate. Or I can actually dial into points within the waveform, and I can manipulate them which is super cool. <clears throat> now, this keyboard, you know, for people that are players is gonna be super wonky. So there's no reason why you can't MIDI into this and have an auxiliary keyboard uh, to control the different oscillators, you know, for those of you that are players. If you're just poking around, and again, this is a groove box step sequencer, this actually is quite functional and makes sense, but if you want to really move around, it's gonna be difficult, especially for those of, once again, that are keyboard players, as I have stated before, I am not really a keyboard player. Um, uh, so this, this actually works for me. Now, if I wanted to use a different sequencer, maybe I would, you know, and keyboard, and you know, I might take, um, you know, like my key step from Arturia, and you know, MIDI out of that into this. This does have, and let's talk about the connections real fast. So you have your standard five pin MIDI in and out. You have an external clock in, so it's going to play well with any number of devices that support uh, the clock protocol. You have your mix in, so you can take an external device and, and um, you know, take the output of that and bring it into here, and you can use the effects. Uh, and other functionality that exists on here. And then you have your standard left, right, quarter inch output, uh, unbalanced uh, left serving as the mono, which has uh, been the case in point with Roland devices going back to forever. And then you have your headphones. It's a stereo headphone out, uh, Kensington lock. And then as I had stated before, USB-C, which is also going to uh, carry power so you don't chew through batteries. So lots of connectivity there. Um, you know, could it have more? Yeah, sure, why not? But we need to talk about, you know, how much we're getting in here at the price point. And if you're somebody that wants to, if you are, <laughs> excuse me, somebody that wants to multi-track this, well then, you know, you take MIDI out of your DAW, uh, Ableton or whatever you're using or via USB, and then you would, um, you know, play different parts and, and bounce them into your DAW. And then you would have, you know, your four different parts would be on their own individual tracks, mono or stereo, depending on how they're set up. Uh, your rhythm part would be on its own stereo track. And now you have a little more control over, you know, how you can manipulate your mix. Unless you just love the way this sounds, you do everything in here, that can be done as well. Once again, really, really powerful. So now that we have this funky, sound that I drew into here. Let's look at the effects really fast and talk about that just for a moment because once again, there are a lot of effects in here. Uh, 95 in all, if my mind serves me correctly. Uh, so we could, you know, spend four hours just talking about the effects. But to access an effect, well, all we're going to do is just, you can see here the reverb button is already illuminated, so I know that if I bring up control one, it's probably going to feed the input to the reverb circuit. And there we go. I can manipulate the reverb circuit by turning the type knob. So we have a hall. SRV 2000, it's not the Stevie Ray Vaughan 2000, that would be crazy, wouldn't it, if this would sound like Stevie Ray Vaughan, I don't even know where I'm going with that, it just, I saw SRV and that's all I could think of. SRV 2000 was an old uh, rack reverb unit, and they were actually really, really cool, they sounded 
pretty fantastic for the time. I, I, I had one for a bit uh, and uh, gave it to a friend of mine that did some work for me uh, that I felt was deserving of it. The gated reverb. Pretty nice. And then you have the shimmer verb. You can hear it pitch up. And if we hold down the reverb button, it's going to give us more parameters. And this is going to be the same for every single uh, effect that's on here. So now if we go to the delay, you can actually hear the delay. Let's turn the reverb down so we can focus on the delay. Pattern delay, three tap, delay tremolo. So once again, a really robust effects engine. Chorus. Roland has always had such great chorus effects, you know, going back to the Juno series and the, you know, the JC120 amplifier, which, in my honest opinion, is the, one of the greatest chorus circuits, if not the greatest chorus circuit ever incorporated into anything. Um, and also really the only uh, decent, and these are my own opinions, the only decent solid state amp ever made. It's such a great amplifier. So just tons of effects to play with in here. And a lot of these effects that they've incorporated into, into this, in particular the chorus, are legacy Roland effects, if you will, coming off the Roland pedals, different effects units, and of course, you know, the Juno and, and the uh, JC120. So you can get really, really lost. And then we also have master effects, which is going to be a global effect. And this can be any number of things. And as I start, excuse me, as I start switching through it, comp limiter, delay, looper, lo-fi pitch, there's so much. Ooh, that got really, really loud, didn't it? Let's see if uh, there is a level here, and it looks like there is. Wow, that really, really boosted it really, really quickly. Uh, so beware of that because I was not aware of that. Um, as far as the master of the master effects are concerned, um, you know I'm one of those where if I'm going to use some sort of global effect on something, whether it be a, a drum machine or a synthesizer, keyboard, whatever, there's a good chance I'm probably going to do it in the box or I'm going to have something in my studio that I can plug into uh, a, a, an auxiliary or outboard, uh, you know, physical outboard device like my Manly's or my DBX's or yeah, any number of other things that I have. Um, just because at the end of the day I know that they're going to give me characteristics that I like. Uh, maybe sometimes those characteristics aren't always necessary. but. I've just found on this, and I haven't, I haven't done a deep dive on the master effects on here yet, but so far when it comes to compressor, limiter, EQ, I'm not super stoked. Uh, is that a limitation? Not necessarily, at least not for me because I have stuff in the box and stuff here in the physical universe uh, that I'm ultimately most likely going to use. So once again, not necessarily worried about that. <clears throat> So let's talk about, now that we've gone through the effects, we understand what's happening with the filter, the amp, uh, the LFO, we haven't played with too much yet. Uh, let's talk about the arpeggiator. Uh, so the arpeggiator, well, that's what it does, right? Let's go ahead and press the hold button. So I'm manipulating my tempo right here. Now, one thing that's nice about this is, if, let's say I'm using, let me go ahead and turn that off real fast. If I am using some sort of time-based effect like, uh, like a delay, for instance, and of course a reverb is time-based, but uh, the delays, we might want to sync the delay. And so we have different options to sync the delay uh, or different uh, subdivisions of 
our uh, notes or timing. And to, to explain that a little bit further, we can sync to whole half quarter, dotted quarter, eighth note, 16th, 32nd note, you, whatever you want. And as you, you know, change the resolution, the delay is gonna appear to be faster or slower, but it's always gonna be synced to your tempo, which is a really nice option. So let's turn this up. Bring it back down. And let's go ahead and add a delay in here so you can see what I'm talking about. So as I change with controller two, you can see that I'm changing the resolution. So let's bring it all the way back. So we're a quarter note triplet. If I hold the delay button down, we can actually change our feedback and other things. And then we start going into the Berlin School of Music pretty fast. It's fun to change the tempo and then hear the delay pitch. Now if we hold down the arpeggi arpeggiator button, you will notice, oh, well I actually turned it off and that was not my intention, but we can change the mode, right? So we've got up, down, up and down, random. The note order, so it will track at which point I actually tapped on one of the note keys, right? And we can even shuffle it. Pretty powerful. Change the gate length. And I just had it go into freak out mode. Um, I was hoping that the trans transpose was going to do something, but it didn't. And so I don't know why, because I'm still learning this device. You can change the octave range. So once again, a lot of fun. So let's find a pattern and we're gonna move around a little bit as we are, move around the device that is as we're listening to a pattern. And let's go to pattern two. That sounds kind of like a new progressive e house type of thing. So let's go back out of pattern. Let's actually go to pattern. Um, so we can mute the different sounds with our mixer. We can change the level. So that would be part one. So if we want to manipulate part one, shift, part one. Oh, we are actually already there in part one. I'm sorry, we're in pattern two, excuse me. So now we can apply our filter. sounds kind of like almost like a wobbly type of bass that kind of swells in. I, maybe wobble is not the right term, but it swells in. So let's do this. Let's listen to part 
two. If I click on sound, which I just did, we have like an extended mixer that we can look at. And here we can manipulate all kinds of different parameters as well. So we are on part one. clear out a part, I'm going to press sound, and then shift, and let's go ahead and just choose part one, and then clear. So now we've cleared out part one, let's do the same thing for part two, clear, part three, clear, part four, clear. So now if we go back to part one, let's make sure we're on part one. different sound. So if we go to here and let's go ahead and stop it for a second. Sound and exit. There we go. Now we can go ahead and go through all the different types of oscillators that exist by just scrolling left or right. And then we can choose different sounds. That's good. Back to our pattern. And so let's open up the filter a little bit. If you want to record something, we hold down shift, and you can see here the silk screen. And so now we can record. So 
that's a quick way to get a sketch in. The sequencer can do so much more than that. And honestly, I haven't really had a chance to dive into the sequencer that much. So I'm gonna, if I were to try to demonstrate that, I would fumble around on it. I, I got so lost in just figuring out how to dial in sounds and do sound design work on here uh, that I failed to really play with the sequencer a lot other than you know finding a funny pattern and then clearing things out and then just kind of you know tapping things in like that. But you can step sequence, you can manipulate the sequences in all kinds of different ways. And that's probably something that we should come back to later. Uh, but it, once again, is just an outstanding, fantastic device. And I've had so much fun with it. And uh, I think I said this before, this is actually coming home with me. I like it so much that I am going to buy it immediately. And that doesn't happen too, too often with me. I usually kind of ponder my decisions uh, before I jump right in. But just based off of the sound design capabilities of this, I was I just was like I want to I want to have this I could throw it in my backpack with headphones and I could just noodle around on it and might create something on the fly might create a great sketch uh, you know for uh, use later might create a whole entire composition once I really understand the power of this device because I think that it is unlimited there's so much you can do you know you do don't, or you don't have excuse me uh, velocity capabilities. Um, which, you know, for some might be an issue. Um, it depends on what you're playing. It depends on what type of music you're in. Um, but again, it's just, it's just such a fun device, and I can't wait to unplug this and have it exit with me from Alma Music so I can take it home and plug it back in and really get to know this uh, intimately. Like, I want to, I want to hug it and I want to whisper sweet things to it. So I'm gonna do this for you because it sounds rad. Um, I'm going to stop this demo here. You understand what this can do now and, and all of its functionality. You don't understand the sequencer yet because I am a newbie and I'm still trying to feel it out, but you know what it can do and it, it can do quite a bit. So if you end up getting one of these, please let us know how you feel about it down in the comments. So as I said, you know, during the demo, there are so many features on this that we really can't get to everything. I wanted you to have a deeper understanding of what this can do, what it provides, all of its functionality, and I think we touched on most of that. Uh, we didn't get into the real deep nitty gritty stuff like the matrix because those are the kinds of things that you can ju just get lost in or exploring all the gazillion effects that exist on here. We can't do all that. Uh, that's really up to you, but I can say this. This is going to become a centerpiece for me uh, in my own home studio. And even if I don't use uh, you know, what I create on here in my productions, I, this is going to become an amazing tablet or sketchbook for me because it does so much. Um, you know, I did talk a little bit about, about its limitations. There really aren't a whole lot, and of course we can really, you know, pick and, and you know, try to reduce it to, you know, uh, all of its different parts. And if we did that, then of course we're not going to be happy, most likely with, with any of its parts. But as a whole unit, as a groove box, as, uh, you know, a contender against a lot of the electron, uh, electron boxes, this is a fantastic device. And, and I think it's just, again, so much fun. So with that being said, uh, Alma Music Center, San Antonio, Texas. I'm Chris Klein. Let's keep the comments civil down below. Let's have a, a healthy conversation and dialogue about what we're using, how we're using it, and let's just be friendly to each other. I'm going to say it over and over again. We need a little more civility in the world these days. Uh, so until next time, keep on creating. Bye-bye.